Many of you have heard about the sinking of the popular British passenger liner called the RMS Titanic. Her infamous story has been etched into the annals of history after plummeting to the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean in the early morning hours of April 15, 1912. Because of her grandeur, opulence, and the list of wealthy passengers on board, her maiden voyage to America, the story of the Titanic has eclipsed the stories of all other sinking ships. On this episode of Power of Truth, we will look at the fascinating story of another sunken ship which predates the Titanic, that also went down on her maiden voyage to the Americas. Like the Titanic, this ship also boasts about her splendid workmanship. She had an impressive list of very wealthy passengers, and the cargo area was filled with gold, silver, copper, and precious gems. God's love for the human family is limitless, and it is our desire at Power of Truth to share the good news of God's amazing love with every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. If you are not a Christian, but you enjoy this program, I want to be a further blessing to you. Log on to tbasilstirrup.com, scroll down on the homepage to your daily dose of hope, and there you will find a paragraph with encouraging words that are there just for you. I believe that your daily dose of hope will help you to start each day on the right footing. The southeastern coast of Florida and the Keys in modern times has become a playground for millions of tourists in search of vacations where they can enjoy the sun, sea, and sand. But there are others who come to this geographical location because it also presents an opportunity for wealth, fame, and fortune. And that's because scattered across the seabed of the Florida Keys are the wrecks of thousands of Spanish galleons with untold treasure still to be discovered. And there are hundreds of men and women who dive into these waters frequently with the hope of finding their fortune. One of the largest discoveries of treasure happened during the 1980s. And last year, when my wife and I were in Key West, we visited the place where most of this treasure is still on display. It was July 20, 1985, when treasure hunter Kane Fisher radioed his father with some beautiful news. Put away the charts, he said. We found it. From that day forward, everybody began referring to Kane and his father, Mr. Melvin Fisher, as the world's greatest treasure hunters. That phone call meant that the 16-year search for the Spanish galleon that sank in 1622 was found, and for the next few weeks, they spent that time recovering the treasure they had discovered, treasure that was worth more than $400 million. The name of the ship was Nuesta Senora de Atocha, Our Lady of Atocha. The ship was built in 1621, and she was regarded as one of the strongest and safest ships in the Spanish fleet. But her return to Europe on her maiden voyage ended in tragedy when she became a victim of an angry storm. The dawn voyage of the Atocha began with an annual convoy that sailed between Spain and the New World each year. And because she was a new ship, outfitted with 20 bronze cannons and a small army of conquistadors, she served as one of the guard ships for the fleet. Her job was to sail in the rear of the convoy to protect the other ships from English pirates and Dutch buccaneers. The Atocha left Spain in March of 1622, following the trade winds to ports of calls in the Caribbean. She arrived at Cartagena, Colombia in May and went on to Portobello in Panama, where she loaded treasures throughout the month of June. She returned to Colombia before sailing to Havana, Cuba, where finally the preparations were made for the long journey back to Spain. In Havana, 265 people boarded the Atocha, including a royal governor, a high cleric in the Catholic Church, and several wealthy families looking forward to returning to Europe. And loaded in her hall were large amounts of Peruvian silver 
and more than a thousand solid silver bars. One fifth of that silver belonged to the king of Spain and some of it was hair tax for the sale of African slaves. The Atocha was also carrying hundreds of thousands of pounds of gold bullion coins, mined and minted in Peru for the treasury of Imperial Spain. Also placed in the cargo area was the treasure of the Catholic Church. Hundreds of pounds of gold bullions and coins brought on board by the ranking cleric. There was also a hefty amount of religious jewelry on board. All of this was separate and apart from the precious cargo accompany accompanying the many wealthy people on board the Spanish ship. I read that one affluent passenger brought all of her worldly possessions on board. And in addition to this, there were crates of oriental porcelain and 15 tons of Cuban copper. The registered cargo on board the Atocha was valued at one and a half million dollars in 1622, which is the equivalent of 400 million dollars today. But there's more. This amount in dollar value does not include the contraband and gold and Colombian emeralds that were smuggled on board. Ladies and gentlemen, to put it mildly, the Atocha was carrying a fabulous amount of treasure on board, and all of it was plundered from the New World. Because some of the ships in the fleet were running behind schedule, the entire convoy did not arrive in Havana until late August. As fate would have it, the Atocha left the port of Havana for Spain in the month of September with 27 other ships. The most important concern for the captains, however, was not the status of the passengers or the worth of the cargo. The greatest concern was the weather, because the month of September is the height of the hurricane season. Under normal circumstances, the trip would have been further delayed, but the captain felt comfortable about sailing because there was a lunar conjunction which suggested that there would be fair weather. So the following morning, Sunday, September 4th, 1622, the convoy left Havana for Spain under clear skies. As the ship approached the Gulf Stream, a vicious hurricane appeared out of nowhere and several of the ships within the convoy were swept towards the reef of the Florida Keys. The entire convoy fought the fierce winds and the waves for 24 hours. Miraculously, 20 ships from the fleet survived the hurricane and returned to Havana. But seven of those ships were unable to weather the treacherous storms. Among these vessels that perished were three treasure ships, the Rosario, the Santa Margarita, and the Atocha. 260 people perished on the beautiful ship that was carrying more than $400 million worth of treasure. Only five persons survived, three seamen, a slave, and a little boy. When I come back, I will tell you about the man who located the Atocha. 636 years after she sank in the shallow waters of the coast of the Florida Keys. And I will also unveil to you the small obstacle that prevented him from finding this enormous amount of treasure for more than 16 years. In an era when people are questioning the existence of God, it is very refreshing and assuring to be able to find a book that affirms his existence. Who is this God by T. Basil Stirrup will introduce its readers to the one true God. The content of this exciting manuscript uses practical illustrations to prove that God is in control of the affairs of this world and that you can trust him during difficult times. If you would like a copy of Who is this God, text or call the number on the screen and get your copy today. Melvin Fisher is considered to be the world's greatest treasure hunter. As a child, Mel spent most of his time in libraries reading about pirates and treasure. It was 
his fascination with these stories that influenced his career path to become a treasure hunter. In 1960, Mel sold everything he had and moved to Florida with a few persons of like minds to fulfill his boyhood dream of becoming the world's most famous treasure hunter. During the years of the 1960s, he began his search for sunken ships and he found lots of gold and silver from a fleet that sank in 1715. However, it was not until 1969 that he decided to go after the greatest prize of them all, the Atocha. There were several other treasure hunting teams searching for the Achotia at the same time. And like Mel, most of them thought that the ship sank somewhere near to the middle of the Florida Keys. They all came to this conclusion for the location of the ship because of a simple misunderstanding. The error stemmed from the first reports of where the disaster had taken place. These reports came from the other ships in the Spanish fleet that survived the hurricane. It was said that the Atocha was lost in the keys of the De Maracambe, or the keys of the De Maracambe. This information, although correct, was able to deceive the treasure hunters for decades because of one reason. And the reason is the words Chaos de Maracombe had a different meaning hundreds of years ago from what it means today. These treasure hunters had thousands of reliable documents to help them, including original maps from the Spanish archives, but for 16 years they could not find the wreck. The only thing that prevented them from finding this treasure for so many years, the big error that they made was this. They believed that the latest maps would place them in the most accurate position to find the treasure of the Atocha, and therein lies the problem. According to the latest maps, there are only two small keys in the chain of islands that bear the name Matacambe. One is called the Upper Maracambe, and the other is called the Lower Maracambe. And both islands are located in the middle of the Florida Keys. As a result, most hunters assumed that the Atocha sank somewhere in the vicinity of these two islands, and the hunters spent years diving in this area, coming up with nothing. So if the documents were correct, why is it that they were unable to find the treasurer? It is one of the oldest tricks that time has played on human beings for centuries. And the answer was found in the way places were named centuries before. As I mentioned earlier, Fisher and the other treasure hunters were searching for the Atocha in a specific location based on what the word Maracambe meant in modern times not centuries ago. In fact, it was not until one of Mel Fisher's friends, Dr. Eugene Lyon, studied this wreck from a different angle that the problem was solved. While Eugene Lyon was in Seville, Spain, working on his PhD, Fisher called him. And in a casual conversation, he said to Dr. Lyon, if you come across anything about the Atocha, please let me know. Eventually, Dr. Lyon was able to reveal the true location of the wreck. And how did he do it? The secret that avoided Mel and the others from finding the treasure was very simple. They had to discover what the word Matacombe meant in the 16th century. Dr. Lyon discovered that in the 16th century, the word Matacombe did not only refer to two islands found in the middle of the Florida Keys, during the 16th century, it referred to all of the keys in the chain. It was not until Fisher and a clear and proper understanding of one word that he was able to find the hidden treasure of the Nuesta Signora de Atocha. There is something we can learn here. 
By discovering the correct or the true meaning of one word, some of the greatest problems can be solved. This is what enabled Mel Fisher and the team to discover the treasure. Have you ever read the Bible or a text or a scripture and then had a difficult time reconciling that scripture to something many people are talking about today? You read it over and over again, but it just doesn't add up. When I come back, I will share with you one of the many examples of how millions of people still misunderstand an important Bible prophecy simply because, like Mel Fisher, they have the right word, but because the word had a different meaning centuries before, it creates a problem for those who read it today. In Green Pastures is a one-minute inspirational thought from T. Basil Stirrup, designed to help you see various expressions of God's love for the human family while we're living in a fallen condition. Log on to tbasilstirrup.com and click on the icon in Green Pastures. Learn more about God and the everlasting love He has for you. In the previous segment, I shared with you the story of how Mel Fisher and his team were able to discover the treasure that went down on the Atocha. The key to their success was to discover the true meaning of one word, and that word was Matakambe. In this segment, we will also discover how the story of the ship played a pivotal role in helping us to understand a very important Bible prophecy found in the book of Revelation. In the 16th chapter of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, we read about seven plagues that will fall upon the earth. Most Bible scholars believe that these plagues will usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. The author of the book of Revelation provide us with startling pictures of these plagues and in verse 16 there is a word that may be very familiar to most of us. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16 the Bible speaks of a great battle called Armageddon. And he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew town called Armageddon. Many of you have heard the word Armageddon before. And if you ask the average person, what does it mean? They will tell you that it is the last great war. Some may say that it is the war that will destroy the earth and civilization as we know it. I recall the headlines in one of the newspapers the day after the desert storm our war began that read, Armageddon has begun. Most people get a part of this word right. It is true that Armageddon will be the climax of the greatest battle ever fought. It is also true that it would be the last war. But like Mel Fisher, we are missing something important. Could it be that we have the right document but the wrong interpretation of what that word Armageddon means? Believe it or not, for millions of people they still have not understood what this war is all about. Because like in the story of the Atocha, they miss the meaning of one word. So let's take a closer look at what the Bible actually says. I will begin reading from Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14 to give a brief study and some context. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. First of all, the Bible says that the whole world will be gathered for this battle when it takes place. The next verse, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watch and keeps his garments clean, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. The next clue we have is that this battle will take place when Jesus returns. 
And the battle says that Jesus will come unexpectedly as a thief comes. Therefore, we are admonished to keep our garments clean. Or in other words, we ought to be in a righteous condition. But here is the final and most important clue in the text. Revelation 16 and verse 16 says, And he gathered them together in a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. The words Armageddon in the Hebrew tongue makes a world of a difference. This is significant because if we use our modern language to define the word Armageddon today, we would look to a small valley in the Middle East called Megiddo. But there's a problem. God says that he will gather the whole world for this battle. And the size of the valley of Megiddo is roughly 147 square miles. Those who reject the Bible mock the scriptures and ask the question, how is it possible for the whole world to fit into the valley of Megiddo to fight a war? The true size of the valley is just too small. So in order to understand the prophecy, we cannot use a modern definition of the word Armageddon. We have to do exactly what the scriptures said. He gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. So what does Armageddon mean in the Hebrew tongue? The Hebrew word is Hamoed, and it means the mount of the congregation. The Hebrew equivalent for this Greek word Armageddon used in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16 is also found in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. And there we find the Hebrew word, Hamoed. The devil went on to say, I will sit in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. It is when we find out what Armageddon means in the Hebrew tongue that the prophecy makes sense. In the book of Isaiah chapter 14, Satan claimed that one day he would replace God and sit on his throne in the mount of the congregation, or that he will sit on God's throne in Mount Zion. Ladies and gentlemen, the final battle to be fought is actually a battle between God and Satan, and the whole world will be present to see it. The Battle of Armageddon will not be a war between nations. It will not be a war between countries. It's the war between good and evil. It will be the climax of the final showdown between God and Satan. This is the reason Satan was cast out of heaven. He wanted to sit on God's throne and become the sovereign ruler of the universe. And from the moment sin entered this universe, the battle has been raging. But you may be asking, how will the battle end? Who will win? The Bible tells us who the winner will be. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, we find these words. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. By understanding one word, Armageddon, in the Hebrew tongue, we now know that this battle will not be fought with implements of war. In the battle of Armageddon, there will be no bombs, no guns, or no hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
It will be a spiritual war. It will be the climax of the battle between good and evil. And the best part is this, the winner is Jesus. For on his thigh is written the name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He will sit on the throne. Satan will be defeated. But before I end this broadcast, let me go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 14 and read it again. But this time I will add verse 15. Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So Satan, the one who said that he would sit on the throne of God, will lose the battle and he will be placed into a pit. The book of Revelation confirms these words of the prophet Isaiah in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should not deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. The Bible says that Satan will be in the pit for a thousand years and afterwards he will be loosed for a little season. So what will be taking place during that period of time, 1,000 years, while Satan is in that bottomless pit? Revelation chapter 20, beginning with verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. After the thousand-year period, Satan will be loosed for a little season. And what does he do during that little season? Revelation chapter 20, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says that Satan is going to go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And the Bible says that fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So when the wicked are raised in the second resurrection, they will attempt to take the city, but they will not be successful. But what will the final symbol be that affirms that the battle is over and that Jesus is the winner? Remember, the whole world is going to be there. Every human being that ever lived from Adam to the last generation will be there. And just before fire comes down to destroy Satan, his angels and those who followed him instead of Christ, on that great day, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is what the battle of Armageddon is all about. Good will be victorious over evil. Now that we understand the word Armageddon and what it's talking about, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, fear can be removed. Our faith will be deepened. And like the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, our cry will also be, even so, come Lord Jesus.